In the second lecture of this course, I presented a basic overview of the uh, oral exegesis process known as the internalization method. The internalization method is, is uh, a basic form of exegesis. It's carried out in a group and it's carried out orally. Uh, the internalization method normally is, or commonly, uh, one person on a translation team leads a group of translators in an open and in-depth depth, uh, discussion and study of the passage that they're um, about to translate. Uh, this exegetical process is much like uh, what takes place in any uh, conventional written translation process. You can't um, translate something uh, that you don't understand, and so the exegetical process is uh, a key part of the uh, drafting process. In this particular uh, video segment, however, I'm going to dis demonstrate and explain how the translator that leads the discussion, that leads the internalization um, process method, prepares to lead that discussion. Uh, that uh, same person uh, prepares first a written outline of the essential narrative elements um, that the group, the translation team, will uh, discuss. Uh, they perform their own exegesis, and that exegetical process is not uh, oral, but written. Um, any um, naive notions about uh, an oral drafting process uh, uh, not needing um, people that are literate, uh, highly literate, able to um, access exegetical resources is, uh, well, in fact, naive. Um, uh, exegesis process is necessary to any kind of translation, again, because you can't translate something you don't adequately understand. Now this written outline serves as a guide for the person that leads the discussion. And uh, this written outline uh, is commonly referred to as uh, the, trans, uh, the trainer's notes. Uh, the outline is commonly referred to as the trainer's notes. The trainer's notes are organized um, into uh, ten, roughly ten um, categories for discussion, ten domains, ten uh, elements of the narration. Um, all of this I discussed and introduced in the uh, second lecture. Um, but just to quickly uh, repeat, there's the theme discussed, or themes, the characters are discussed, um, the contexts, the various contexts uh, that, um, that uh, uh, compose the story, the geographic, historic, social, cultural, religious, economic, the plot itself, the main line uh, storyline, uh, the events, the sequent event of events, the climax of the, or climax points of the story, the narrative, the main ideas or themes, as I said, uh, certain twists, unexpected turns in the story, the opening or openings, possible openings, and ways to close the story, and of course the uh, key terms, the difficult words, phrases, expressions, and concepts. The outline um, that uh, this trainer's uh, uh, that composes these trainers' notes um, covers all of these ten areas and guides the facilitator, the one translator that leads the discussion. He or she has already, prior to the internalization process, prior to the discussion, has uh, adequately um, studied and exegeted uh, these various um, elements in the story. Uh, walking into the room, they're the expert. Uh, 
they can tell the story um, from heart by heart and I've repeated it a number of times, uh, memorized it, consulted various commentaries and exegetical aids um, uh, to better understand the story and when they enter the, um, the uh, internalization process uh, they're prepared. Not that they tell everybody what they know but that they're able to uh, guide uh, real questions about all of these elements uh, and help the rest of the team discover um, those elements uh, together to exegete it together. Here is an example of uh, a set of trainer's notes for the story in which Jesus uh, forgives and heals a paralyzed man from Mark 2, um, 1 to 12. Um, as you can see here, uh, the 10, uh, 10 categories, 10, 10 narrative elements are, are uh, outlined, the theme. The theme here, the characters. Uh, in this case, uh, the characters, uh, of course, the, the facilitator has already investigated uh, Jesus and uh, the people uh, living in the village of Capernaum. Uh, a crowd of people uh, gathered outside, uh, gathered at the home in which the event took place. The uh, people who um, brought the paralyzed man on a stretcher, the paralyzed man himself, um, uh, and Jewish uh, scribes or teachers of the law are all discussed. Um, on the second page, uh, whoops, this uh, second page we see another um, domain, the domain of the various contexts, the uh, geographic, historic, cultural, social, religious, economic, and agricultural contexts. And this particular one um, uh, that I led, I focused uh, on uh, geographical elements, um, uh, the region of Galilee in general with this uh, map over here, um, and then uh, the village of Capernaum, um, uh, uh, where it was, how big it was in that historical period, um, what other parts of the scriptures uh, talk about them, and then the, the home itself um, that's described. The flat roof home is, uh, and notes are taken on, on that house and home. Then later, the, the plot is discussed. Um, they are uh, enumerated here step by step. Um, as each event unfolds, the first um, event, uh, the crowd that gathers, uh, Jesus preaching, um, uh, Jesus uh, preaching the word of God, and the paralytic is brought in, etc., 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 so that all of the, uh, as I discovered, the main 11 sequences of events took place, they're enumerated. I went in to the uh, internalization uh, session completely prepared to recount uh, the uh, sequence of, uh, of the plot um, uh, very quickly, but uh, didn't do that. Instead, um, led the group in a discussion of them, as I demonstrated in the uh, section le second lecture. Then the climax of the story is um, uh, discussed. And uh, the main point of the story or main themes of the story are um, discussed. Uh, twists are um, discussed. Um, possible reordering of the sequence of events is discussed. Um, for the sake of translation, openings, closings or endings. And then, of course, the key terms, the difficult words and phrases, uh, such as uh, the word of God, um, faith. Uh, for, to forgive, uh, forgiveness in general, uh, the word sins, uh, teachers, of, uh, teachers of the law, uh, blasphemy, um, uh, the term son of man as a title, even the, uh, even the um, 
term amazed, uh, I uh, anticipated could be a, a point uh, to discuss. And so all of these terms, I uh, turn to various exegetical aids to better understand uh, the, um, the uh, sense of those terms, especially in uh, ancient Near East uh, and uh, um, uh, and the uh, the range of meaning that uh, each of the terms um, 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 expresses. So all ten of the elements are accounted for in the uh, trainer's notes here on the story of uh, J Jesus forgiving and healing the paralyzed man. And Mark 2, 1 to 12. The facilitator, the person who leads the internalization, again, uh, prepares in private uh, to lead that discussion by preparing the trainer's notes. And they do that uh, in a number of ways, one of which is they, um, that person um, reads uh, more than one, three, maybe four, uh, at least a couple of versions of the story in the language of wider communication. Normally, at least uh, one version that's quite literal. Uh, he reads it aloud and, um, and then reads uh, another version that's uh, more idiomatic and uh, simpler grammar, uh, etc. cetera. Um, again, reading that one aloud. Um, and of course, the person eventually has to choose one of the versions as the um, the uh, the version that they'll tell aloud in the internalization process to the group. Uh, on top of uh, that process, the person uh, memorizes that story. That's also part of the exegetical process. Having learned it well enough to tell it by heart, the person by now is. Um, quite familiar with um, uh, the characters and the setting and the sequence of events in the story, uh, all of which contributes to a better understanding of it. Um, but as I've also said, the same person, a literate person, uh, is able to consult various biblical commentaries and exegetical aids. There are a number of exegetical aids that um, this person, uh, the facilitator, can consult. Um, I've only chosen one here, a useful one, I think, not because it's the, the best one, but, uh, but simply as uh, one among many uh, that uh, can be used to complete, to fill out uh, the notes in the trainer's notes, uh, as I've um, already uh uh, illustrated with the story of Jesus uh, forgiving and healing the paralytic. Um, the particular exegetical aid that, that I'll use here is one uh, uh, called uh, Translator's Notes. Here are the uh, Translator's Notes for the Gospel of Mark, um, chapters 1 through 8. Um, the Translator's Notes are... Um, are, is a series published by SIL International. Each volume in the series is a verse-by-verse -verse exegetical translation aid on a particular book of the Bible, in this case uh, Mark, and is primarily designed to help Bible translators who speak English as a second language. And yet, while most of the volumes are authored by members of SIL, suitable works uh, by others uh, also form a part of the series. This uh, particular one uh, is edited by Randy Groff and Linda Neely. Um, it was uh, completed in 2008. Um, here's a quick look at uh, the table of contents of uh, the, these translators' notes. Um, you can see that um, uh, the particular uh, the ways that they've segmented um, the various um, sections of the Gospel of Mark, uh, chapters 1 through 8, the stories, uh, and as a glossary, a bibliography, and endnotes, and some other guidelines. 
It provides, uh, as you can see here, um, uh, in in these translator no, uh, translators notes, um, there are um, two basic kinds of settings for each section of a story. There are uh, in, uh, summary introductions. Uh, there is summary introductions to um, paragraphs. Uh, there are um, commentaries on uh, verse by verse commentaries for uh, them. Uh, and, and with recommended um, alternatives uh, for translating each of these uh, ver uh, verses, sets of verses, and a, re uh, a recommended one in, in addition to the various alternatives that there might be there. And then there are um, actual examples of um, alternatives that other um, uh, published versions uh, have offered for these. So the range, a uh, range of meaning, uh, interpretation is uh, shown here for uh, e each of the uh, s um, sections of the Gospel of Mark. Uh, they also offer um, recommended uh, reference helps on Mark, uh, what they consider to be the go-to um, commentators on uh, uh, the Gospel of Mark. Uh, quite an extensive bibliography. So everything that's in this particular um, exegetical guide is uh, based upon the work of uh, a number of other people, all these various commentators here. Uh, that provides an introduction to the whole uh, Gospel of Mark uh, in preparation for um, uh, exegetical preparation for um, translation. Um, there's a, a book, an entire book summary here of uh, the Gospel of Mark. And uh, for each section uh, that comes up, uh, there are, um, there are uh, summary uh, statements uh, about that section. In this case, uh, you, we see that the uh, starts with uh, the very first verse, verse, uh, uh, verse, uh, chapter one, verses one through eight are covered here, and then it goes on to cover all of the um, uh, verses and sections in Mark one through eight. The story that I prepared, of course, is the story of uh, the time when Jesus healed a paralyzed man and forgave his sins, uh, chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 12. And that's the um, uh, um, material now that I'll show how I drew on all of the sections that followed from here, from verses 1 and two and three and four and five and six and seven and eight and nine and ten and eleven and twelve um, uh, verses for this um, for this story. Now I drew upon the information here, the commentary and uh, the various uh, alternative uh, translations to complete the trainer's notes that I. Um, uh, introduced earlier in this uh, video segment. The trainer's notes for the story of Jesus forgiving and healing the paralyzed man. So now let's uh, begin to, uh, let's go back and go um, uh, somewhat um, section by section, verse by verse, to show how I drew upon uh, this particular exegetical aid to complete the trainer's notes over here. The trainer's notes here were about uh, five pages long and the, um, the, the uh, translation translator's notes was about 14 pages of information. Generally before I begin uh, giving attention to the details of the story and filling out the trainer's notes here to the left I try to gain a um, a sense of the bigger picture from the translator's notes in Mark 8. Um, in this case, I would uh, I turned um, uh, to the um, some of the introductory remarks about the gospel, that gospel, the authorship, um, the intended readers, 
setting, language, and culture, including key players in the in the uh, in this particular book, uh, the political situation, um, uh, key terms in that particular a book, proper names as they're referred to, and distinctive features of that book. In this case, uh, again, uh, Mark's Gospel. Uh, further, I'd probably um, get uh, as big a picture as I could about the whole uh, um, storyline and contents by some sort of summary uh, aid, a reminder, uh, again, for the sake of the big picture. And then normally I would uh, read two, three, uh, four versions of the story, if not the entire book or gospel, uh, to gain... Uh, a sense of the range of uh, style and uh, translation uh, from pretty uh, idiomatic translations to a fairly uh, literal interlinear type of translations. Also remind myself of the episodes uh, that preceded the particular episode that I'm dealing with here because uh, some of the information in the story that I'm dealing with in chapter two uh, depends upon a knowledge of the uh, material in the first chapter. All of this again to gain uh, the big a sense of the big picture before I begin to go verse by verse or character by character um, in the trainer's notes um, over here. Fairly often then when I begin to um, study uh, the uh, story at hand, the narrative at hand. Um, I generally uh, look for information in the order that uh, I would present it in the internalization process. In this case, I would uh, start with the characters here. And uh, you can see in this particular Example, um, the, the um, six uh, characters that I dealt with were Jesus, uh, people living in the village of Capernaum, the crowd that gathered at the house that Jesus was in, the four people carrying the man on the stretcher, the paralyzed man himself, and then uh, some Jewish scribes or teachers of the law. So let me begin with the uh, first first one obviously the main character here is uh, Jesus himself um, when I turn to the translators notes uh, in mark uh, the, uh, the, the whole, from mark uh, 2 1 to 12 I uh, will have read the entire I think about 14 pages of this and uh, highlighted those places where um, uh, information about Jesus is um, is uh, um, presented, uh, noteworthy information about him, what we know about him, what this story newly tells us about him, um, the the genius of this particular story. Um, these are all these highlighted sections here are um, things that I uh, get, uh, took note of. Um, much of the information on Jesus can be gained uh, directly from the story itself, of course. Uh, what he said, what he did, what he thought, what others said about him, what others uh, did with him, how they reacted to him. But then there are some, um, some information that uh, the exegetical preparation here, turning to translators notes, you can't get from the story directly some contextual information about uh, Jesus, this particular one. Um, uh, the exegetical notes drew attention, for example, to the fact of um, the issue, the theme of Jesus's authority, not only to heal, but to forgive. Uh, the fact that Jesus, for example, here had been to Cap uh, uh, Capernaum before, Capernaum before. Um, and uh, that the uh, house that he was in was likely, as they put it here, uh, that he didn't own the house necessarily, um, and it wasn't where he was uh, born, but it, he probably returned to that same house often. 
and you wouldn't necessarily know that from reading the story and the exegetical aid helps in that case um, uh, uh, the exegetical aid also dealt with um, some of the um, uh, titles uh, that were used either by Jesus or about Jesus. Jesus refers to the paralytic as his son, um, which uh, uh, indicated, according to this exegetical help, um, uh, a certain um, attitude that Jesus had toward him, a, a gentle attitude, uh, which helps uh, begin to frame our concept of uh, this character, who he is. What he, um, what role he plays in people's lives, um, uh, he be this exegetical aid drew attention to all the types of rhetorical questions that Jesus posed, the kind of teacher uh, that he was, the kind of interlocutor that he was with the people. Um, it drew attention, to, for example, here to uh, the fact that uh, Jesus's questioning of the scribes was uh, was quite strong language. You might not get that from the translation, uh, from these uh, rhetorical questions, but the, the exegetical help here refers to the fact that G this was a rebuke uh, by Jesus uh, of uh, the, the teachers of the law. And uh, he was really challenging them. Further on, um, he it drew attention to the to the fact that Jesus uh, referred to himself as the Son of Man, and you would not necessarily know from the story, just from hearing it, that this is a title, and that this is a title um, heavy with uh, uh, connoting a, a lot of uh, meaning uh, to the Jews of that of that time. Uh, just who is the Son of Man? What is the Son of Man according to this exegetical aid? So um, a number of those um, of those um, of this information about Jesus is gained from a look at this exegetical help. These commentaries that were um, that helped form this exegetical help um, to give a fuller picture of Jesus that we might not know from the story directly itself and might be informative for the translator as they begin to translate, uh, knowing the kinds of attitudes that uh, Jesus had towards those he spoke to and though the attitudes that uh, uh, his interlocker has had toward him, uh, which of course would uh, have a great effect on the kinds of word choices that were made, um, how strong or um, neutral um, these word choices would be. So that's... Uh, uh, an example of uh, some of the um, information that we get about Jesus from the translator's notes over here. I would have marked this up with pencil and paper, um, drawing attention to uh, all this information. After um, treating um, the character of Jesus, I went on to um, uh, consider the uh, other characters in, in the order in which they are introduced in the story, the, the people in the village, uh, the crowd at the house uh, here, and the uh, people carrying uh, the paralytic on the stretcher. A general information about them is presented through in different places in the exegetical aid. Um, it draws attention to the fact that um, uh, Jesus had uh, was known among the people, having returned there, uh, having uh, been uh, stayed at that uh, home before, and that he had been at the region, in the region, uh, teaching and healing before. So the ex expectation, as is drawn attention to here, is that uh, they brought him uh, to Jesus to be healed. Uh, and uh, obviously, to their surprise, the first thing Jesus did was say he forgave his sins rather than to heal him. Uh, so uh, these places in this um, exegetical aid uh, speak about the people that were drawn there and their reaction that uh, they, as a group of people, had never seen anything like what Jesus had done before. Um, all of which, most of which, uh, information can be drawn from the story itself. The only um, help that the exegetical aid provided here was the fact that uh, in the previous um, uh, episodes to this episode here, this story here, 
uh, they drew attention to the fact that Jesus had a reputation and uh, he was reputed to heal and that was their expectation. After I uh, gathered some information from the translator's notes on the, um, the people in Capernaum and the crowd there and the people that brought uh, the paralyzed man there, I turned to the paralyzed man himself. Here's some information um, um, looking to see what um, uh, distinctive information I could get from the, uh, from the translator's notes. And um, uh, it did draw attention to the fact that, uh, you know, this mat that the paralytic was on, uh, we don't exactly know what it was, uh, whether it was a stretcher or a, or a rug or exactly what it was, four corners or so forth. It did clarify the fact that uh, a paralytic is uh, someone who uh, some can't uh, move some part uh, or all of his body. In this case, the paralytic uh, couldn't walk. Um, so, of course, the, the choice of a word for paralytic might be problematic in, in various cultures. So it uh, clarified uh, uh, in this context what uh, a paralyzed man was, what part of his body, parts of his body were paralyzed. And... Um, it, uh, it, um, the commentators drew attention to the fact that uh, it was likely he exercised faith in this act too, along with those that brought him, and further that um, socially um, and religiously, this uh, someone who was paralyzed, um, as it draws attention to here, something you wouldn't know from the story, that many Jews believed that when a person was sick, it was because he or she or someone in the family had sinned. It gives references in other parts of the scriptures uh, where this is uh, the case. And uh, they believe that uh, he, he could not become well until God forgave his sins. So um, this background knowledge from this exegetical aid, it does help the translator understand better um, some of the social and religious, socio-religious implications of uh, the the relationship between sin and uh, for, sins being forgiven and bodies being healed, and Jesus's authority to uh, deal with both, um, as as he calls it, uh, calls himself the Son of Man. The last character or set of characters um, to be accounted for in this story and uh, talked about and discussed in the internalization are the um, <clears throat> Jewish scribes, the teachers of the law. The translator's notes <clears throat> addresses them quite a bit. Addresses uh, who they are <clears throat> religiously and socially. Um, <clears throat> and that they thought, and rightly so, <clears throat> that only God could forgive <clears throat> all of the sins a person had done, committed. <clears throat> and so, uh, in the, um, the notes, <clears throat> quite a bit of description is um, given over to <clears throat> who the teachers of the law were. <clears throat> so, um, some um, translations um, uh, call them teachers of the law. Others, like the RSV, call them scribes. <clears throat> Historically, scribes uh, did just that. They copied the laws of Moses by hand. But in the New Testament times, <clears throat> the translator's notes um, clarifies the fact that they studied, interpreted, and taught the law of Moses and related Jews, Jewish laws and traditions. <clears throat> And that they rightly understood that Jesus, <clears throat> or that, excuse me, that uh, only God could forgive sins. And uh, in their mind, as it draws attention to here in this whole section, that Jesus was just an ordinary person <clears throat> and was not the Messiah. <clears throat> and <clears throat> they used words like uh, blasphemy, that they blasphemed God. <clears throat> uh, uh, and what uh, blasphemy was, I'll, I'll uh, talk about that later in dealing with the difficult words and terms. <clears throat> but uh, Jesus's dialogue with them, or um, rather his monologue with them, they didn't say much. 
um, <clears throat> about what forgiveness of sins was um, and their attitude towards him and his him towards them is uh, a big part of the drama and uh, an important um, dynamic for the translators to understand the um, <clears throat> the the conflict between their understanding of who Jesus was and who he was trying to show them who he was. <clears throat> um, he uh, handles them again using a um, ser series of rhetorical questions <clears throat> to get them to think about uh, their pre uh, preconceived notions of who he was, um, legitimate and, and uh, reasonable that they might have been <clears throat> and uh and then of course they at the end were part it was drawn attention to that uh, they were part of the group that was there and uh, that saw um the implications of what jesus said and did in his forgiving and healing uh, of this man i uh moved on from um <clears throat> studying the the characters and preparing for the discussion the group discussion the internalization of who the characters were the the characters are in the story to um questions of uh the context the various contexts um <clears throat> that needed to be um uh, understood and uh, taken into account uh in order to render the story uh in a meaningful way um, the geographic, historic, cultural, social, 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 religious, economic, agricultural, and so forth. In my notes, <clears throat> uh, I I uh, I mainly gleaned information uh, having to do with the geography, uh, geographical, the actual physical setting of the story, um, where uh, Galilee was. Um, turning to the uh, the uh, translator's notes uh, to find maps and uh, and um, uh, pictures of the actual house, the physical house where what houses uh, looked like in the ancient Near East at that time, <clears throat> how large they may have been or not been, what the uh, village of Capernaum was, how big it was. It was a seaside town. Uh, maybe a couple of thousand people <clears throat> part of uh, israel and that uh, jesus had been there before <clears throat> and so uh, you can see here in the in the uh, translator's notes uh, that capernaum was uh, addressed um, uh, the population um, the house itself was uh, described and that it was large it was so large that many people could be um, could uh, be fit inside. Um, uh, again, here are the pictures. Um, uh, uh, part of the description of the house would have to do with the fact that they were flat-roofed houses, uh, which you would not know that from the story, or that there were uh, the way to get to the roof was by way of a stairway uh, that we know from archaeological uh, findings and so forth. And so all of this section here in the translator's notes draws attention to that so that when the translators have to describe the action that's taking place, um, <clears throat> uh, they can do so with a fuller picture of, of what they're actually dealing with. Because, of course, architecture around the world is uh, not the same everywhere and not everywhere has a flat roofed home. And uh, it might not be so easy to describe those guys talk, uh, climbing on top of a, a, a steep-pitched thatch roof house, for example. So those um, kinds of things need to be accounted for. Um, beyond <clears throat> the um, descriptions of uh, the region and uh, the village, the town of Capernaum, and the house itself, I could have in this uh, section here uh, uh, drew attention to some of the uh, the religious context of uh, the Jewish uh, religious tradition, notions of faith, for example, in here. What is faith? And what does that have to do with the drama of this story? What is sin? What is blasphemy? Who is God? What is forgiveness? All addressed in these uh, translators' notes. But um, I chose to um, enter most of that information later on in my uh, 
um, trainer's notes uh, uh, in the uh, category of difficult words, concepts, and expressions. Um, handling blasphemy and forgiveness and sins and faith and belief in the con and God in the context of um, discussing the um, key terms, the key religious terms, the religious context that was uh, shaping the story. <clears throat> Some information was drawn attention to what the mat was, um, and what it wasn't, to who the Son of Man is another, or, you know, um, a so sociocultural religious um, um, notion uh, that needed to be discussed. But I, again, chose to do that later on here um, in the tr uh, trainer's notes, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Though all of those terms, so many of which were religious um, um, lays the groundwork for contextually understanding. After I um, address some of the contextual uh, material, specifically geography, and I implied some of the religious um, <clears throat> material context, I turn to the plot. Um, I frankly did not use much of the translator's notes to um, begin to account for the plot because the plot as um, <clears throat> as it is accounted for in the trainer's notes is pretty pretty bare bones. The uh, mainline action is described and none of the very little if any of the um, the um, <clears throat> discussions, the uh, monologues or dialogues uh, are, uh, are recounted in length. For example, when G the whole discussion that Jesus had with the scribes and the, the scribes in this case, I just uh, said Jesus challenges, questions the religious leaders, mistaken notions about his authority to pardon sins. And so um, in the plot, I simply um, summarize the, the um, the grand movements, actions of the uh, of the story uh, into uh, eleven, as it turns out, um, uh, actions, large actions here, and 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 never really um, found anything useful in the translator's notes to uh, clarify that. After um, addressing uh, the uh, the uh, plot. Uh, describing it in those uh, basic 11 uh, sets of actions. <clears throat> I went on to uh, consider the climaxes uh, or peaks in the story. <clears throat> it was a potential petite peak, obviously, when Jesus, when they lowered the man down through the roof, but uh, that actually turns out to be a twist in the story, as I'll discuss uh, in point seven here later. <clears throat> but the climax is actually addressed in the uh, <clears throat> translator's notes um, and uh, described here in the very last <clears throat> uh, page of the translator's notes of the time when the, the paralytic got up, took his mat, and walked out. They explicitly say this is the climax of the story, and it should be introduced in a natural way in the language, <clears throat> which implies that a lot... Um, about the discourse, the flow of the discourse, and that uh, if the, the passage is not translated in a way that this climax is marked, well, <clears throat> a story without um, um, these kinds of shapes is uh, no story at all, no drama at all. And so that's addressed um, explicitly in the uh, translator's notes. After um, addressing the um, notion of the climax or peaks of the story, I'd turn to um, addressing themes, uh, main ideas, main point of the story, if you will, points of the story. As you might uh, suspect, um, <clears throat> the summary uh, um, to this, uh, this story, Mark 2, 1 to 12, is uh, would deal with um, themes, and and so it is here in the translator's notes. The notion of Jesus' authority is uh, the claim that Jesus had the authority to forgive sins, and of course, <clears throat> um, the implications as to his divinity. 
So Jesus, uh, the theme stated, uh, as they put it here, if the heading is to be put on the section, uh, that the heading uh, could read that Jesus showed that he has the authority to forgive people's sins. <clears throat> Another theme could be that Jesus healed a paralyzed man, both of which are true, but <clears throat> I'm sure that's thematic. In any case, this is what I found here, and this is what I... <clears throat> um, offered to the um, to the group when we did the internalization um, session. <clears throat> uh, I went um, directly on to the twists um, uh, of the story. I had already talked about that back here as part of the plot, and that along with the um, at the section where Jesus forgave the man after he had <clears throat> they had. Uh, it forgave his sins after they had uh, lowered him through the roof. Uh, it was a twist in the story, an unexpected turn. The people had brought him uh, to Jesus, the paralytic to Jesus, in order to be healed, and instead of healing him, he forgives his sins. And not only does that uh, not meet the, their expectations, but of course um, causes a conflict with the scribes. Having uh, discussed the... Uh, the um, Twi climax pain points and uh, twists I moved on to consider if there were any parts of the story um, that could possibly uh, need to be ordered in order for it to be understood in a more natural way in another language given the fact that um, syntax and uh, ways of thinking are different um, cross-culturally in different languages and um, I turned to the translator's notes, and they specifically drew attention to um, the uh, the section in which uh, the, uh, the the story describes uh, the thought processes of the scribes, the teachers of the law, when they said, "Why does this fellow talk like that?" And and then the next um, part of the verse is, "He's blaspheming," followed by, "Who can forgive sins but God alone?" The the um, notes here <clears throat> draw attention to the to the notion that uh, in some languages it may be more natural to express the parts of this verse in a different order. <clears throat> uh, commentators uh, apparently have run into this problem, translators, and they offered <clears throat> three three different optional orderings of this. For example, here putting. The statement, it is blasphemy for a person to say that a man's sins are forgiven first, and then followed by no one can forgive a um, uh, person's sin except God, or no one can forgive a person's sins except God. This person is blaspheming by saying that the paralytic sins are forgiven. Or God can forgive sins, but a person cannot. When this man says he forgives the paralytic man's sins, he is blaspheming against God. So these various um, <clears throat> orderings of the syntax <coughs> of the phrases <coughs> are, <coughs> are um, anticipated and proposed. And um, I noted these here and was prepared to discuss them. <coughs> during the internalization process, if uh, need be. I did go on to <clears throat> this, to consider then uh, a possible way of opening the story, <clears throat> uh, to start it uh, just with the phrases, uh, the phrase, a few days later, uh, later after what? Um, if you're just uh, presenting this story, <clears throat> then that's <clears throat> can be a confusing opening. <clears throat> the ex, uh, the notes draws attention to the fact that um, uh, that this story begins a new story that happened a few days after Jesus healed the man with leprosy in in um, <clears throat> in chapter one forty to forty five. So to begin the story, one could say instead of a few days later. Uh, one could say one day um, uh, Jesus returned, entered the uh, Capernaum again. And another um, instance I uh, remember saying, uh, one day after teaching and preaching throughout the region of Galilee, 
which I would have known <clears throat> but reading the previous episodes and the um, translator's notes draws attention to this. Uh, no specific effort was made to um, anticipate the need for a clever ending other than to just reiterate the title of the of the story being Jesus heals and par a paralyzed man and forgives his sins. The last um, uh, um, category to be uh, treated and, and studied and exegeted concerns uh, um, the difficult words or phrases or concepts or expressions or key terms as is commonly, uh, they're commonly referred to in Bible translation. Um, let me uh, make this a little clearer. Um, the, I don't know how many I uh, drew attention to, it was the notion of the Word of God here. I anticipated that we would need to um, discuss the meaning of the word faith, meaning of the word forgive, meaning of the religious term sins, uh, the, uh, the socio-religious term uh, teachers of Jewish law or scribes, uh, the term blasphemy, title, son of God, and I thought maybe even the word amazed might be um, problematic too. So <clears throat> I turned to, this is where I found a lot of uh, um, help in the uh, translator's notes. The first the term being the, the word of God here. Um, let me see. Where is that? Okay, preach the word. Uh, the Greek phrase that the NIV translates as preach the word is literally was speaking the word, it says here. Uh, the phrase the word refers to God's word or to God's message. Um, Jesus told people what God wanted him to tell them. Other ways to say this they uh, suggest are, for example, taught God's word or made known God's message. So I... <clears throat> I um, took some of this information and placed it in my notes to remind me that uh, Jesus was telling the people the words or messages that God wanted him to tell them. Similarly, with the word uh, faith, here in um, the uh, um, translator's notes, uh, the concept of faith is drawn attention to. The Greek word that the NIV translates as faith refers here to an action of believing and trusting in Jesus. The, mean, the men believe that Jesus would heal the paralytic. And they say in some languages it may be more natural to translate faith as a verb. Uh, if that is true in your language, you may also need to say what they, what they believe. For example, Jesus realized that the paralytic and those who brought him believed that he could heal the paralytic. It goes on here in these notes to... Uh, refer to that very same term in the glossary of the um of the um of the translator's notes here and sure enough here is uh, a whole section that clarifies the range of meanings depending upon the context uh, of that term uh, the term believe or the term faith whether it's a noun or a verb here uh, to accept a statement or a message is true or to entrust oneself to God or Jesus. The person who does this trusts in, depends on, and commits himself to God, to Jesus. It draws attention here to the, to the very passage we're talking about in Mark 2, 5. Uh, to have confidence that God can and will act even in extraordinary, way, in extraordinary ways in response to your need. This confidence is that God can change things from the way things they are now. For example, the sick can become well. Um, so it offers advice on this range to help um, to help me, it helped me uh, guide the discussion and consider um, in the internalization process the range of meanings uh, so that they would choose a good word or phrase uh, 
to um, express this confidence, this kind of confidence in uh, uh, in um, in God's uh, can and will act uh, on our on our um, on our behalf for our needs. Similarly, the word forgive is uh, addressed here um, uh, in, in the translator's notes. It was canceling the paralytic sins. The man would not be punished for them. God would treat him as though he had not offended him in the way in those ways. Other ways to translate it, they offer are the sins are taken away or are canceled or are pardoned uh, terms that uh, might be suitable synonyms or choices in the the target language uh, uh, similarly after the term forgive uh what the term sins uh referred to i drew attention to that up here uh what sin was uh is helpful to translate sins with a general term that can include any offense against god and they anticipate some problems in the translation here the term should not imply that only serious crimes like murder or stealing are sins other offenses like gossip and greed are sins uh, the term should not include accidents or mistakes that are not against god's will or um, any, uh, a few other um, recommendations here as well. Further, the, the notion of the teachers of Jewish law or the scribes is also addressed in the notes. Um, I, I discussed that earlier. It, uh, it draws attention to the fact that that very term, again, is not only addressed in this particular verse, but is also um, addressed in the, um, the glossary. Um, let me just quickly go to that. Uh, the teachers of the law. Uh, what what is a teacher of the law? Uh, was a, a man who was uh, whose most important work at the time that Jesus was to study and interpret and teach God's laws. They were important people in the Jewish religious system because of their enormous knowledge. The Jews greatly respected the teachers of the law. Um, so it goes on to describe that and, and hopefully give the translators a clearer idea of, uh, of their social role so that they can choose terms or expressions or descriptions that, um, that fit it well. Went on to discuss um, blasphemy here in the uh, address specifically. The Greek word in the NIV translates as blaspheming often means speaking against God or dishonoring God in a serious way. In this context, it refers to claiming to do something that only God had authority to do. Speaking as if Jesus was speaking as if he were God. So with that in mind, um, the, the discussion, uh, I could uh, help guide the discussion in a more um, uh, a fruitful way, a helpful way in the discussion. Not teach them, but be prepared to um, to fill out things, to suggest things, to challenge them, to help them speculate. And then the term uh, "son of man," the title rather of the "son of man," is addressed uh, here in the translator's notes. Um, it's a kind of a lengthy discussion. I'm not going to get into that now. You can uh, read this further you like, pause the video and, uh, and read my, um, my summary here that I drew from the discussion here in the translator's notes. I did go on uh, and had gathered from the translator's notes a few other scriptures um, that um, could help, help me understand the wider context, and I, I listed them here at the end, uh, most of which were from uh, the Gospel of Mark, but uh, from other places as well, especially dealing with the title, the Son of Man, etc., and the notion of the forgiveness of sins as found in the, in the Old Testament here. Of uh, concluding thoughts, having gone through the process of uh, filling out uh, the trainer's notes um, as based upon the uh, translator's notes, um, one is that 
This uh, is uh, intended uh, not only as an exercise uh, to, to, um, to learn to exegete using narrative criticism um, categories, but also to underscore the fact that uh, no oral strategies uh, that call themselves oral Bible translation or oral Bible storytelling are um, exclusively oral, that no one on the team needs to be able to, translation team, needs to be able to read and write. That greatly misrepresents the process. Um, many of these people forget that the uh, people that come and lead these workshops themselves and lead these internalization processes are, are very literate and know how to consult and access exegetical tools and biblical commentaries, etc. So um, I would like to emphasize it once again that um, oral communication and written communication, uh, as uh, as happened uh, for a very long time now, um, coexist and interact in uh, interesting, uh, fascinating ways. And uh, we should not overstate or understate uh, their um, the place of either orality or literacy in the process. And then finally, um, uh, again, I wouldn't want anybody to think that I'm recommending translators' notes as the best or the exclusive exegetical aid or uh, commentary uh, that um, one should use. I just wanted to give an example of what it would look like to fill out the trainer's notes using um, uh, expert exegetical uh, uh, aids and commentaries um, as part of the assignment, the exercise, the homework assignment for this uh, course here at this point is to is to prepare a set of trainer's notes. Uh, you yourself will have to decide which um, exegetical aids or uh, biblical commentaries um, you will want to consult um, in order to help you um, fill out the trainer's notes, which in turn will be your cheat sheet, your, uh, your outline and summary uh, that you'll need to be prepared uh, as you lead a group of translators um, in uh, the internalization process that takes place just before orally drafting or orally rendering uh, the, um, the biblical passage at hand.